I have a favor to ask. Okay. I took a, a bunch of math classes in high school and a little bit in college, but the calculus thing, I'm not sure that really happened. <laughs> I think I might have no, like, like, surfed through that one a little like bit. Like calculus didn't happen or you didn't take calculus? I feel I took it and I feel like I understand or recognize some of the terms that come up that are related to calculus, but it is a black hole in my understanding of mathematics and I feel like it would be helpful to understand that because I feel like it's the place where mathematics and philosophy start to horseshoe back around together. These are both universal languages of reason and understanding. And I feel like I need to understand calculus better. And I feel like you're really good at explaining things. And we're right here in the same room. So I would like to confess my ignorance to you. I'm a calculus idiot. I don't know what I'm doing. And I would like to know what I'm doing. And would you please give me that knowledge in the way you do where it makes sense to normal people? Wow. <laughs> How hard can it be? It's just calculus, right? Sure. Let's go. All right. So calculus. I don't know. Hmm. Okay. So let's... <laughs> <laughs> so um, how about we just do it without using any fancy math words? All right. Okay. So when I was a kid, I was sitting in a car. I forget if it was my dad driving or my Uncle Stan. I forget who was driving. But I remember observing that there was something hanging from the rearview mirror. Okay? Imagine a pendulum hanging down from the rearview mirror of a car. Sure, like a new age crystal. Sure, whatever. <laughs> or or a tree air freshener, whatever it needs to be in your mind. Okay. And imagine that we're at a stoplight and the windows are rolled up. So wind's not a really big deal. The air conditioner's off or whatever. And the light turns green. And when the light turns green, the driver steps on the accelerator and you're a kid and you don't know words, you know, and, but you're looking at that pendulum and you realize that as you accelerate that air freshener or the sunglasses hanging from the mirror or the, let, let's just pick a thing. What, what is it going to be? Uh, the John Denver new age crystal for channeling. Okay. A crystal it's, it's, it's hanging down or like a pendulum. So this pendulum swings to the rear of the car. The distance that it swings backwards is a function of how hard the accelerator is pressed, right? Right. So when I was a kid, I was in this car and I was looking at that thing and I noticed, I was like, man, that thing's moving backwards when we speed up. When we slow down, it moves forwards. And or it, if, or if, it seems like that. It seems like that. And, and if we're doing nothing, like if we're not accelerating or decelerating, whether that's at rest at a stoplight or if we're going down the road at 60 miles an hour, if we're not changing anything, then it seems to just kind of level out and just hang straight down. You with yeah. me? Yeah. So I remember thinking that and I remember thinking, wow. Because I had this nightmare when I was a kid that one of the Sesame Street monsters ate me, and that's relevant to this conversation. Wait, what? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll, I look forward to the connection. So in the uh, in this nightmare, uh, this monster ate me, and I had a robot outside of the monster and that I had a remote control to, and I could control it. I had a really weird dreams when I was a kid. Okay. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I have to fight this monster with my robot, but I can't actually see my robot. So I have to like infer where the monster is and figure out where everything is. Without actually getting to see anything. <laughs> okay. We're getting a calculus, I promise. No, no, no. I like how this is working. Yeah, I yeah. feel like I'm about 60 seconds from finally understanding you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the idea is if we were to black out the windows in the car and the only thing we could see is that pendulum, could we figure out where the car is? Right? We can't see anything. All we can see is the pendulum. We don't even feel the acceleration or the deceleration. You know, when you go around a curve to the left, the pendulum swings to the right. Could we look at this pendulum and could we figure out where we are? Let's say we start in your driveway and could we start adding up the things that the pendulum does? And could that get us to a place where we could figure out where we are? Like, oh, well, like which direction it moves, how quickly it moves there, how long it takes to correct back to neutral, add all that up to figure out like how far we traveled in each direction. Yeah. For example... 
Huh. You're at a stoplight. All you can see is the pendulum. And then you see that the pendulum swings backwards and it stays backwards for two seconds. And then it slowly starts to go back to straight down. Well, that tells me, well, if we were at zero miles an hour, I know that the pendulum will swing this far back based on how fast we're speeding up and then it slows down. So we must be going 60 miles an hour now, right? Based on however long the like if you knew all the things about the pendulum. Yeah. I, you with me? I'm very with you. Yes. Okay. So I had this thought as a child <laughs> and I thought to myself, <laughs> there's something there. There is something there in that you had that thought as a child. And so I thought about this a different way. I thought, well, what if I had a bowl, like a just a, a spherical bowl, and I put a, a marble in the center of the bowl, and I held the held the bowl just you know straight with the horizon, and then we accelerated, and then that marble would move opposite of the directions we were accelerating. If I could add up the time that the marble was in a certain place, then I could figure out where we were and how fast we were going. How old were you when you had this thought? I don't know. It was before I knew. Like 36? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just didn't know much about math or anything like that. Like yeah, I, but dude, like just step aside from all of what we're doing here for one second. You were going to be an engineer. Like I'm telling you, man, that is nature. That is in you. And I'm very curious about the world and I poke at things like that too. And I'm always curious about it. But when I was riding in the back seat with my dad at the age I'm imagining you were, I remember being like, you know, I just wish everybody was religious. I just wish they were all Christian, dad. What if you just moved somewhere and made a Christian town and all the street names could be Christian and all the rules could be Christian and nobody would ever fight again? And dad was like, well, what do you think wouldn't work about that? And I was like, hmm, well, eventually maybe, maybe somebody wouldn't believe it anymore. Right. And then what would you do with them? Oh. <laughs> and so like dad and I went on a ride and like we figured out Western liberalism and like why you have to have an accommodating, tolerant society that works for multiple belief systems and what things you could distill it down to. And that was my dad more than me, obviously. But I, I think about that anecdote a lot. And I'm like, you know, I was probably going to be somebody who turned out to think about philosophy and the abstract and ethics and things like that. And I, I've never really thought about what little kid Destin would do in the back of the car and what he'd wonder about. And you're back there thinking about how to blind remote control a combat robot to defeat Cookie Monster. Yeah, it wasn't Cookie Monster. They... It was one of them that had teeth. It was the big red one. Oh, the that... red one. Yeah. Yeah, he does have teeth. Yeah. And and you're figuring out how to make like a, a model of physical motion out of a bowl and a marble and intuitively you knew that you needed something that could contain the marble and it would have limited friction so that you get an accurate read right exactly on how <laughs> on the directional yeah. movement I, that's just incredible that your kid brain did that and i'm sitting here looking at you you're not telling me that with body language like well when i was a kid <laughs> i solved newton's law like, like this is just what you thought about I think yeah. that's amazing. It's pretty cool. Of course you do what you do now. It's fun. It's fun. So fast forward through all, you know, the basic math and I got to trigonometry and I got to trigonometry before I got to trigonometry because my dad told me uh, a little mnemonic to remember sine, cosine, tangent. And I'm not going to tell you the mnemonic because everybody has their own. Oscar had a hunk of apples is one that somebody uses. Sokotoa, some that other people use like sine, cosine, adj you know, tangent. So sine, opposite over hypotenuse. So trigonometry is the science, or not the science, it's the, the math of triangles. I love it. It's awesome. That was cool and all. Comes time for calculus. Let's don't use the big words. Let's just imagine things in our head. So so let's, let's say that we're going to draw a line. So we've got, you know, go ahead and give yourself an axis, a y-axis and an x-axis in your head. And let's just draw a squiggly line and it's going to go up and down. It's going to move to the right, up and down, you know, some peaks and valleys. It looks like mountains or whatever. And let's think about that function is, is what that's called. But let's just think about that squiggly line. Let's start thinking about how we would describe it. If you were a little man that was walking along this thing, you, there'd be parts where you're walking uphill and there'd be parts where you're not walking uphill or downhill. You're just kind of walking sideways. And there'd be other parts where you're walking downhill. And that kind of describes what it's like. And there'd be moments where you're working harder, 
because you're going uphill and there'd be moments where you're kind of, you know, going downhill. It's almost pulling you down. Cashing in on the potential energy you stored up walking up the hill. Right. So there'd be different moments that you did that. And so the description of, am I going up or am I going down? I think about that with life, right? Like I might not be winning or doing the best, but as long as I'm improving myself and getting better, that's good. And so I would say that the slope is going up, right? If I'm going downhill, the slope would be going down. So at any point along this squiggly line, if you could measure the amount of up you're going or the amount of down you're going, then that's what you would call the slope of a line. Like if you if you got the squiggly line in your head and you draw a tangent to that squiggly line, you know what a tangent is? I think so. So like if you got a curve and you were to draw a line that just basically kisses the edge of the curve and it, it just kisses it in one spot, one little point. That's called a tangent line. So if we were to draw a line that was tangent to our squiggly line at any one point, then that is what's called the derivative. The slope of a tangent line of a function is called the derivative. All right. So the tangent is the stick of the letter P that is adjacent barely to the circle of the letter P. Right. Okay. Letter P. We're, we're doing not a capital P. We're doing a lowercase P. Lowercase P. Yeah. So we got the circle. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Like the Patreon P. Yep. The circle and line. Yep. That stick, the line. That would be tangent to that tangent. circle. Yes. And the derivative is. Well, in your case, you just got a circle in space, and so you don't you haven't defined the coordinate system. So uh, don't really think about that. <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> yeah. So okay. Well, take take us back to the x y. Uh huh. We're putting it there. So tell me again. Let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Okay, so we've got the x y. We're in the first quadrant of the Cartesian coordinate plane. Do you know what that means? Upper left. Upper right. Upper right. Upper right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So all the x values are positive, and all the y values are positive. So let's imagine that we have this sea dragon that's going to hop along the x-axis and he's going to go up and down and up and down. And he's like a squiggly, he's hopping, right? And so you get the arch on the top of his back and then it's going back down. And let's say he turns back before he hits the x-axis or the, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. He's kind of bouncing along there. So if we were to kind of like run along him, like Sonic the Hedgehog kind of thing, if we have a line at the very top of that sea dragon that would touch the top of the sea dragon's back all the way across, that would be a tangent line. Gotcha. All the way across. And so here's the cool thing. That tangent line is the derivative. And at any point along the way, if the derivative is positive, that means the function's going up at that point. So like as you start walking up the sea dragon's back, then the derivative is positive. And as you start walking down, the derivative is negative. So the slope of that line is negative. All of this is entirely common sense when you look at or think about data, even as a lay person. This is the language takes a second to yeah wrap your head around, but it's simple language. Right. So you get that. Yes, this looks like something that everyone intuitively looks at all the time when they look at or even conceptualize data in their head. Right. And so what happens right at the top of the sea dragon's back or at the moment where it's flipping from positive to negative? What would the slope of that line be? The slope of that line would be dead flat. It's like when you throw a baseball to somebody two stories above you and they catch it at that moment of apparent pause right. at the very top. It's the moment where your upward momentum has expired and you've rolled over into downward momentum. Right. And so the slope of the tangent line at the top of those peaks is zero. Yeah, it's just moving, you know, it's just slope is zero. And so the cool thing about a derivative, Newton figured out, Isaac Newton figured out, like, you could do... What's interesting is he figured out calculus during some type of pandemic. I think it was the plague or something like that. And he had to go home for the semester. And uh, he was at the house. And my man, Isaac Newton, figured out calculus during that time. It's really cool. He was a young man, too. So anyway, so Newton figured out, like, if I have a function and I take a derivative of this function, which he just invented a way to do that, if I take the derivative of this function, I can figure out what the function is doing at any point along the curve. And so magically, 
since the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, if you set the, and I know I'm, I'm getting more technical here, if you set the derivative equal to zero and you find out where the derivative is equal to zero, that's going to be all the peaks, the maximum peaks, and that's going to be all the troughs. So everywhere sure. that it changes, it goes up and down. So the peaks and the valleys, that's where the derivative is equal to zero. And that's referred to as a local maximum or a local minimum. I'm tracking with everything. Can I step back and go bigger picture question for a moment? Sure. Trigonometry is figuring out the business with triangles. I yeah. loved trigonometry. Yeah. Really enjoyed my physics courses. Very interesting stuff. What's the simplest way to define what calculus is? Oh, my goodness. Mm. I'm not the guy to ask to that. Um, the, the way I think about calculus is a way of, <laughs> depending on if you're doing derivatives or integrals, calculus is a way of dividing things down into infinitesimal parts and then adding all those parts up. That's what an integral is. But for dividing me- Dividing math, dividing motion. Dividing anything up. So calculus is a way of taking, you know, instead of doing math with discrete numbers like two plus two equals four or like do, real simple, calculus can handle really messy things, like really, really messy things. If you think about, if you think about that pendulum swinging mm -hmm. in the car example, well, it's not just, oh, well, it's at zero pointing straight down and then it's backwards for X amount of time. There's this whole continuous thing that happens as it swings backwards. So, you know, if we were to use old school math, we would say, okay, well, it's it's going to be tilted back this much for two seconds. And then we would just kind of swag it. We would approximate it. But it didn't accelerate evenly back to that point. <clears throat> Correct. Right. And there's probably more than one force acting on that. If you're backing out of the driveway, it's not just a single linear directional force. You're turning the wheel to reposition the vehicle and it doesn't move at the same time the vehicle moves because it's it's still there. So it's almost moving at the same speed as the vehicle, right? But not it's, it's not, not really. quite keeping up. Yeah. So, And that's why it appears to move. So, so what you're saying is that calculus lets me get beyond those very primitive problems that we did with basic physics and that we did with trigonometry where There's a all things answer, were equal. Yeah. The rock is on ground. The coefficient of friction is exactly this. Ted can exert 150 pounds of force in that exact straight line. He needs to move it 10 feet. The rock weighs in, in those kind of problems that I would think of as being simple math. Heavily constrained problems. Heavily constrained problems. Your John Denver satanic New Age Dungeons and Dragons crystal. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm referencing 1980s Christian so many fundamentalism. Words. So many words. That crystal that's <laughs> swinging around in the hanging from the mirror. It defies all of those simple constraints because there's just so much going on. It lets you do math on a continuum. So you're able to add up all the little bitty parts that are so small that you can't do it. So, for example, let's think about that. There are ways to do this. On the lead up to calculus, you do all these weird problems like summations and stuff like that. So, for example, there's this thing called a Riemann sum. That's a fancy dude. R-E, no, R-I-E-M-A-N-N. -N a Riemann sum. And so basically, if you were to take a messy curve, and let's say we wanted to add up all of the area under, let's say we have a rectangle in the top right quadrant on the graph. We have a rectangle. You know how to do that, right? You just you just take the length and the height and you multiply yeah, them together. And they, a squared plus B squared. No, that's that's uh, something else. But Did you say perimeter? No, if you were going to add up the area. Oh, you said area. Yeah. Forgive me. Yeah. So so basically, the you take the length and the height and you multiply them together and that gives you the area. Yep, yep of course. So what do you do if that's curve? <laughs> what do you do? Well, I mean, we covered that stuff in geometry, but I don't think we knew why when we learned that in geometry. Not, not a simple curve, not like a circle, not oh. a, not even an ellipse, but like a, a weird a curve. A glob? Yeah, an amoeba. How do you do A potato. I'll tell you what I would do to figure that out. Yeah. I would get out, I, I'd blow that up on a photocopier. Mm -hmm. to like a big gigantic scale. I'm not joking. This, If no, I, I had no, to do it. I'm not joking either. This is how I would do it. I'd take that little diagram. I'd blow it up huge. I would graph it. Like I'd literally draw pencil graph lines over it into pixels where I could calculate the pixel mm -hmm. 
And then I would go through, and this is just, this is where my ability level is at. Then I would add up each easy pixel. Yeah. That is a simple square. That's easy part of the equation. Yeah. Then I would go through and I would try to break the remaining pixels down into triangles that are small enough to accommodate for that curve with almost accuracy. Yeah. I would add those up of the same size and then I would add the whole thing up and it would take me hours yeah to do it and you're right there, there's you just hit on several things the you know something called the trapezoid rule you just hit on several things and so what a lot of people did early on they were trying to figure these problems out they did exactly that they divided this curve up into a bunch of different rectangles and so let's say the the curve was 10 units long they would go one unit and then they would draw a rectangle and they're like, well, the curve, you know, the the top of the curve kind of doesn't really hit. You know, I've got this. this. So they would kind of split the difference and draw the rectangle halfway in the curve, halfway out of the curve mm-hmm. to kind of average it. And then they'll go to unit two and they'll do the same. Unit two, do the same. And then they, they measure the length or the height of all those things and they would calculate the area and they would add it up. They'd do a summation, right? Well, that works okay. But you could you could do the same thing. But instead of doing a rectangle, you could do a trapezoid. You draw a really tall rectangle, and at the top where you have this curve, instead of drawing just a flat edge, you just draw a little a little peak on it, like a little roof on the top. Right? Which is still a pretty easy area calculation. Right. Sure. So that's what people were doing back in the day. They were trying to figure out how do you get the area under the curve. You, you divide it up, and, and you, you get these little things. And so do you think it would be more accurate if you would have bigger rectangles that you were adding up or smaller rectangles? Of course, smaller. Okay. So what do you think the most accurate unit, like what is the smallest unit you would use in order to calculate dead nuts accurate, the area under the curve? What what would be the best possible length to use? Like a, a micron, like something that is almost invisible to the eye where you'd have to use a gigantic telescope to look at the ink edge and... I mean, that would be ideal, impractical, but ideal. So so something that would be like infinitesimally small, right? Yes. That's the word. That's the word in calculus. Is is so we, we're gonna divide this we're gonna divide this area up into an infinite number of infinitesimally small sections. And if we could do the math on each of those sections, then then we can get the true area under the curve. That is calculus. Huh. Yeah. You can use this for a billion different things. And so that gets you the area under the curve. And so calculus is divided up into several different parts. You, Give me your top five of those billion. Of of what's cool? Of what, what you'd use it for. Okay. So if you wanted to calculate, um, there's a huge area called kinematics where you want to understand the relationship of velocity to acceleration to position. Like you can use calculus and you can go back and forth from all those. And that, and that gets back to the thing I was describing earlier, the pendulum. This is my favorite example. So we'll go there. So the pendulum example, when you measure the pendulum, you're measuring acceleration, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'm doing in my head is I'm trying to get from acceleration back to velocity and then all the way back to position. So here's a, here's a really interesting problem. Wait, okay. Just to make sure I'm with you on the, terms acceleration being how quickly that mass gains momentum gains velocity can we do it this way yes. so position is where you are that that one's easy okay if you're changing position between me and you the amount of time it took me to get from me to you we can get velocity that's the change in position with respect to time Right. Yeah, sure. So if it, if it took if you're ten feet away, it took me a second to get to you. That's, you're going ten feet per second. Right. The change in velocity with respect to time is acceleration. Sure. Yeah. So it's just one more step. So all I did But acceleration isn't always even. You could accelerate to uh, ten uh, to five feet per second, but then decelerate in the same trip to me to one feet per per second and the total average time that it would take to get from you to me is is x but it's a much more wonky equation to figure out how fast you were going at any point 
or what the curve of your journey would look like. I, I know I'm not using the right language. No, you are. And so, but there's some interesting clues in that, right? So we know that when I start here at this location, I'm not moving. So at this location, velocity is what? This is flat. It's nothing. Zero. When I go to you, I have to accelerate and do whatever. But when I get to you and I stop there, my velocity is what? Zero. It, if you stop. Right. But if the point is only to be in this position for any amount of time. Right. The most efficient way is to just keep going past it like overrunning for space. Yeah. And so we can define boundaries. So I can define what my initial condition is right here. And I can define mm -hmm. what my final condition is over there. And if I can do that, then I can put boundaries on the math problem and I can figure out actually what's happening. And so the problem is, okay, you're a little Destin, you're in the back of the car seat and you're asleep, right? And you wake up and you look at the, you look at the pendulum and it's not moving. It's, it's hanging straight down. You, you don't hear the rumble of the car or anything like that. We're, we're going to remove all that stuff. All you see is the pendulum. Are you moving or are you not moving? We can't know, right? But Remo removing just basic like road bounce and yeah, well, yeah. We just it's a it's a perfect new asphalt road, right? Uh, great suspension on the vehicle. If we wake up and, and we we look at the pendulum, we don't know what our initial condition is. Yeah, we don't know if we're moving, if we're not moving, nothing. All we know is from this moment, whatever we're doing right now, we're not accelerating, and then. If we see the pendulum swing back just a little bit, we know we accelerated. Mm -hmm. We don't know if we went from zero to two miles an hour. We don't know if we went from 60 to 62 miles an hour. We don't know. We have to know our initial condition. That's a big part of calculus too, is figuring out your your initial conditions. Your baseline. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So f figuring out, that's an interesting thing. So in calculus, there's two main things that you use. They're called derivatives and integrals. Okay. So a derivative is I'm going to I'm going to make sure I get this right. So if I take a graph of position over time and I take the derivative then I can figure out velocity. None of what I'm about to say is going to make sense. It's a ladder, okay? If I take a derivative of velocity I can get acceleration, okay? Okay, but I can also go back down the ladder by taking integrals. If I take a, an integral of acceleration, I can get velocity. And if I take an integral of velocity, I can get I can get displacement. So, so what's an integral and what's a derivative? Right. So simply put, this is the simplest way I can say it, a derivative is the slope of the tangent line. Measured in which direction? Up or down. If you were to draw whatever your function is, draw draw your squiggly line, the mm -hmm. derivative is how much you're going up or how much you're going down. That's all it is. And we read that away you from read the that, center axis? Yeah, we read that at any point along the curve. If you're a person and you're, and you're walking on this squiggly line, it's how hard you're going up or how hard you're going down. If you're going all the way up, you know what I mean? So, I mean, what would your, your slope would be infinity there. If you're going all the way down, your slope would be zero. When anything in between is a number, an actual number. And if you rock past straight up, well, now we're into... Yeah, don't even worry about that. We're just into a different... Don't even worry about that. Gotcha. This episode's of No Dumb Questions is sponsored by Audible, which I love. And Matt, what is the book that we're we're all listening together for the book review episode coming up? That is Hate, Inc. by Matt Taibbi. I think I'm saying the last name right. I still don't know for sure. Yeah, I think so. So this is an interesting book, and man, I, I want to just launch right into the episode, but we can't do that, can't we? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I think people just don't understand is how much this exercise hurts our friendship. And we're sacrificing here because we read these books together, and then we want to talk. But then it's another two months of every time we get to that place in the conversation, just as we're chit-chatting in normal life, it's like, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you about that because it comes up in hate ink and we're not going to unwrap the present without mics on. There's a cost is the point. There's a cost. <laughs> there is. All right. So here's the deal. If you want to participate uh, in that episode in a like full on mental way, 
then please consider going to audible.com slash NDQ, as in no dumb questions, or you can text NDQ to 500-500. That gets you a 30-day trial and a free book and access to the library. You can do that by going to audible.com slash NDQ or texting NDQ to 500-500. Why should people do it, Matt? Why should people do this on Audible? Well, it was a good deal before when you just got a credit every month because, you know, that's about a good amount of time to power through a quality book and think it through carefully. But now you have access to this entire plus catalog that they've been developing over the last, I don't know how many years here. And it's gotten to the point where it's worth it on its own, apart from even the credits and the traditional way you would think about using Audible. There's just so much content. And for somebody like me who likes the old stuff, a lot of those classics, a lot of the great minds of the past are now available for free just as part of your Audible membership as a part of that Plus catalog. So I really like that. Absolutely. I am very surprised at some of the titles that I'm finding in the Audible Plus catalog, and uh, I'm pretty pumped about it. But I am most excited about listening to Hate Inc. and talking about this with you. We, we should probably give a disclaimer here. here. There's, like, there's potty words in this book, right? We should say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I knew all the swears, but I learned a couple. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that when you listen to this book, it'll help you see things better. You can see the matrix on specifically headlines. You start to understand the headline mm -hmm. better. And man, I want to launch right into it. Anyway, let's just leave yeah, it right yeah, there. Yeah, 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 me too. I have begged some people I really, really care about and respect to please, please, please get this audiobook and listen to it and consume it so that we can talk about it offline. Yeah. Because it's like once you get this deeply insider perspective, and and this is not a partisan insider. This is somebody who wrote for a long time for Rolling Stone and has been around several campaigns, understands the political cycles and the news cycles and all of that. Once you get a little bit of a sense of what it's like behind the scenes – you just start feeling like the scales are falling off your eyes. And you're like, whoa, I see what they're doing over there. Hey, and you guys on the other side of the aisle, you're doing Matt, it too, Matt, right stop. over there. Matt, I get stop. it. What? No, stop. this doesn't count. Please don't stop. I'm having this, fun. Okay. Stop. That's You're getting into the episode. Shout out to Dan that uh, is in my small group with me that <laughs> went and got the book when we mentioned it the last time. Uh, he's in a small group with me and Lee. He did this on his own accord, and we started talking about it. Anyway, Audible.com slash NDQ or text the word or the letters NDQ to 500-500. That gets you a, a trial of Audible and access to the Audible Plus catalog. It's awesome. Thanks to Audible for supporting the program. And thanks to all of you who support sponsors because that's what makes this thing go. Oh, that's derivative. That's derivative. Derivative is the slope of the tangent line. What's a unit of derivative? So Degrees? The way you take a derivative, <laughs> let me get to let me get to integral first. The, okay. the answer is you put it down in front and decrease it by one. I had this uh, calculus teacher in high school named Coach Booth, Coach William Booth, also the state championship baseball coach, and he had all huh. these little sayings. The way you take a derivative is, you know, in l let's come up with a simple function: y equals two x. Okay, y equals two x. You remember that from algebra? Well enough. So the slope of that line is 2. Y equal mx plus b. So the slope of that line is 2. So y equal 2x, the slope of the line is 2. At any point along that curve, the slope of the tangent line is going to be 2. So sure. what you do to take a derivative is you look at the variables. So we got 2x. And all you do is you take whatever power the variable is raised to. So in this case, x would be to the first power, x first power, right? all you do is you take that number that's above the x and you put it down in front of the x and then you take one off of it. So the derivative... Ah, I know, no, no. Okay, so I got the exponential. Don't worry about... No, no, don't, don't, let's not use these words. Okay. Let's do it this way. So y equals 2x. The derivative of y equals 2x is, y equals t is just 2. two. Okay. Y equals 2x squared. Is 4. Oh, but you take one off of it. Yeah, so it'd be y equal, y prime is equal to 4x. 
So, because we took the two from the top of the x square and we put it down in front and multiply it, and then we then took one off of the two and made it a one. Yeah. Okay. So the derivative of y equals two x to the cubed power. We're going to take that three. We're going to move it down in front, multiply it by the two. So it's being y equals six x square. Because we took a one off the x. Put it down in front. Decrease it by one. Okay, stupid question. Here we go. Why would you not just measure that in degrees like you do in geometry? What do you be, mean? I mean, can you look at a derivative and be like, it's that number. I can I, I can see the matrix. That's what it is. Well, the beautiful thing about taking a derivative is that now we can figure out the slope of the tangent line anywhere along the curve. We're doing simple numbers right here. So y equals x squared. The derivative of y equal x squared is 2, Take decrease it by 1, 2x to the first power. 2, instead of x squared, we take the 2, we put it down in front, it would be 2x to the first power, so just 2x. Derivative of x squared is 2x. Okay, put it down in front, decrease it by 1. What's the derivative of y equals x to the third power? So put it down in front, so it'd be what? Y, y prime equals y prime is it 9? No. I'm not I'm not tracking. Okay, so so y equal x cubed. Okay. Got that in your head? Yeah, so we're moving the 3 down. Yep. So it'd be y equal 3x and then by 1? Is it 3? I, I don't understand I don't understand what we're modifying with the 3. Got it. All right. I I just can't I have to see it. Okay, I'm going to draw this out. This is the third chair is at a disadvantage here. So if I've got y equal x cubed. Yes. I'm going to take that 3 and I'm going to put it down in front. 3. That is what I was picturing. X, and then I'm going to decrease that by 1. I'm going to make it what? So that's 2. Yeah, so be so, 3x squared. So we're at 6? No, that's How it. How does it work? That's the answer. That, that's the entire answer. That's the answer. Okay. It, forgive me. I'm almost with you. I can feel the gears about to align. Uh-huh. So y and x are positional yeah. on the coordinates. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, but we don't know what those are in this hypothetical. Right. But that's how I would, okay. That's how you'd figure it out. And so. And, and the advantage of this. Hold on. No, I'm so sorry you had to draw it. That isn't fair to the third chair. The point of the exercise was to do it without. Well, well let's do this real quick. It, I, I want to make sure you, you have one thing. So if I have Y equals X to the fourth power, mm -hmm. what is the derivative of that going to be? You can do this now. So that's going to be Y equals four X cubed. Dude, you got it. What's the derivative? Hang with me here. You can do this. Well, let's just do one more of those. Y equal X to the fifth power. What is what is the derivative going to be? Y equals 5X to the fourth. Yeah. Put it down in front. Decrease it by one. Okay. You got it. Now I'm going to do something weird to you. I'm going to put two terms in there. Y equals, ready? X cubed plus X squared. Do I just repeat the process for both? Yep. So y prime y equals three x squared plus two x. Okay, you can do derivatives now. Okay. Put it down in front, decrease it by one. That's it. That's all you do. Okay. Okay. And and the advantage of this is whereas in my simple geometry class in eighth grade or whenever I did it, I could figure an angle. Blocky and, shapes. Yeah, blocky shapes. What which, this does, which, as we established, I could get to some elements of what we're trying to solve for in calculus with that over a very long period of time and with a photocopier that can enlarge things. It wouldn't be perfect, but we could get to some of these functions. But what, what you're saying is... What you could do is you can, plug in, you can plug in anything you want now. And I don't have to have the photocopier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you could plug in two... Or you could plug in 2.0000352. Right, right, right. You know, you could do, you could plug in anything you want along the continuum. Can I explain uh, what an integral is? Dude, you can sit here and explain this to me all day. Yes. <laughs> okay. So nice of you to ask as a, a social courtesy, but yes, I'm I'm enraptured. Okay. So how do you take a derivative? Tell me that. Uh, put, put it down. Equals... No, put it down in front and. Take away one. Okay. Put it down in front, decrease it by one. The way you take an integral is... You put it down in front and you add one. You kick it up and you divide by it. 
Oh, dang it. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's what you do. I once blind guessed the name of your dad. Yeah. So it's really fun to throw those darts out there and just see if they hit things from time to time. I'm going to throw you for a loop here, but to take the integral of y equal x squared. What is the name of that? That's a parabola. Y equals x squared is a parabola. But so that's, we're but trying that's a to function. figure out locations within a curve. That's a function, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is called a function. This is a function, yeah. The basic function? Yeah, basically. It's a function. This is where we start from? Yeah, kind of. I'm yeah. just trying to understand where I would encounter this and why. Uh, y equal x squared is something that happens every day on Earth. If I were to throw you this pencil, <laughs> <laughs> the curve that it traveled between me and you was a parabola. So y equal x squared def define the position of that pencil as it flew, you know, because it slows down at the top. And so if you wanted to find out how high that went, you could just set the derivative equal to zero and you could figure out where it was because you know it's not going up or down at that point. This is how they're stat tracking how quickly a baseball leaves the bat, how high it flies, how far it goes in real time. Kind of. Kind of. Yeah, they're, they're using this stuff in the background. But yeah, that's cool. So you know how to do derivatives now. Integrals. Integrals, whereas a derivative is the slope of the tangent line, an integral is the area under the curve. So if I were to, you know, draw any function, the integral is if you were to add up all that stuff. It's the scaly shaded part of the sea monster, not the air above the sea monster. Correct. Got it. Exactly. So the way you take an integral is you kick it up and divide it by it. So the integral of y equal x to the square is y equal, you kick it up, y equal x cubed divided by three. So you kick it up and you divide it by whatever you kicked it up to. Correct. Sure. Yeah. So, so, so what's, okay. the, what's the integral of y equal x cubed? Uh, it's y equals x to the fourth over four. Cool, huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it gets weird. I'm pretty good at adding one thing to a thing. <laughs> All right. So here's the next thing. The area under the curve, right? If you were to take an integral of acceleration, okay? Acceleration is what we were measuring with our pendulum, right? Earlier in the car. Yes. So if you were to take the integral. Okay. In integral area. Under area the curve. under the curve. Yeah. Derivative slope of the tangent line the tangent line okay if, if yeah. you were to take the integral of acceleration mm -hmm. you could figure out your velocity but i can figure out my velocity in a simple controlled problem with simple controlled parameters using less than calculus but acceleration as it occurs in the real world which is uneven and sloppy and non-linear I need this. Yeah. So do. falling back into what I learned in high school and being like, no, Dustin, I don't think I, I can turn my brain off. I already got this. That's cute, but it doesn't translate to actual knowledge of an actual truth of what is actually happening. This is designed to take us to that level of precision and dealing with the real world. Right. But when you take an integral, there's this magic thing that happens. You have to know where you started from. So my little example earlier, I woke up and I looked at the pendulum. Yeah, the baseline, as I clumsily called it. Yeah, okay. it's called the constant. And so when you take an integral, you do this other thing. You add a constant. Capital C? Yeah. Okay. So you you kick it up and you divide by it and you plus C. Kick it up, divide by it, plus C. That's how you take an integral. Yeah, and that just accounts for we're not measuring an infinite amount of area below the curve. We have a starting point for this measurement, this this information we're trying to gather. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So my, just surely by the word, my primitive brain would have guessed C constant means like the average of the acceleration. I would have guessed it would have meant like some sort of consistent through line on the data that we're gathering. I wouldn't have thought of that as meaning what I would call a baseline for my, I guess, more accounting terms. But that's great. I mean, just sometimes words are a little bit deceptive and your brain pictures the wrong thing. Yeah. So basically what you can do with this plus C is is that that takes into account all the sloppiness where you don't know the in initial conditions, right? So it's a snapshot of whatever that was. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a snapshot 
but the C, um, we're acknowledging like, hey, going backwards, we, we have to know some initial initial values. And how do you know that? How do I know what? Just simple measurement skills you learn in basic math and science to gather your information about where things started? Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. Like, like rulers? In, in the example earlier, we were talking about um, we were talking about, well, I know I started here and I know I ended up there. So I know my velocity was zero here and my velocity is zero there. So you would use those to define the integral. That's called a, a, a definite integral, meaning we know the initial value values and we can plug those back in and we can get answers to our questions. You were sitting there, so it's zero. Yes. So some of these can be gathered using reason. Yes. Others, you're going to have to get out a stick or something to figure out what you're looking at, I would assume. Yes. Okay. I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of this stuff, but I feel like I'm not a great explainer of these things. Like I, That was pretty good, <laughs> man. Well, I mean, the, the challenge is to explain something that, you know how, I don't know, you probably, uh, you probably have these shortcuts in philosophy where you're like, oh, yeah, it's like uh, transmonsonism. Except I'd never use that word, and Dr. Monson <laughs> resents you using his name in that example. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? Like, oh, well, there was this shortcut that just did all this stuff automatically, and we're just going to say yeah. the shortcut. Yeah, of course. And so what I just tried to do was a very poor job of explaining of walking your, I mean, can you imagine? Did it force you to go back out to a more 10,000 foot view of a thing that you use all the time? Yeah. To remember why it does what it does? Yeah, absolutely. Because when you, when you do this stuff in, I mean, I remember, <laughs> I'm not great with this program called MATLAB. MATLAB just does all this stuff. Like you just like derivative of this, blah, blah, blah. You know, it just like, it just does everything easily. And I'm not good at MATLAB. And so I revert to these dumb little ways of doing things sometimes with like Excel spreadsheets. I remember I made this thing one time that shot a rocket down a rope and I had a certain mass and I calculated, I call it a step. And I, I would calculate the thrust of the rocket and the mass and then I would use F equal MA and I'd get my acceleration. Okay, force equals mass. I'm just, okay, I'm yeah. with you. And then I would just step that forward in time by a thousandth of a second. And I'd say, okay, that means it's going this fast now. And I've burned this much propellant, so now I weigh this much. And so I would just step through, boop, 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 and I would add up the velocities over time. That's how I would do it. Yeah, I backed out. I Basically, that's that's like poor man's calculus. It, but it's some, the same way I use poor man's keyframing to animate in Adobe Premiere when I edit things. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you, you say, I want it to be this at this time. I want it to be that in that time. And this mm -hmm. is how I'm going to get there. Absolutely. If I want it to move quicker, I just squeeze the dots closer. Yeah. If I want it to move a little slower, I stretch them out. There's no science to it. I don't know what I'm doing. But I mean, the interesting thing about calculus, if you want to go the speed of light, for example, you don't have to just like melt your whole body into the seat accelerating super, super quick. It's all about the area under the curve, how long it takes. So if you could... If you could develop a rocket that pushes one gram worth of force or, or one, whatever your unit of choice is, one, it, instead of like a billion pounds of force, the ideal rocket would be, well, let's just, let's just push out the back here at, you know, a few Newtons, nothing big. Let's don't go crazy, you know, or a one hundredth of a G, but we do it for a year. Huh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so we're, we're going to just gradually accelerate very, very slowly. And so calculus lets you do things like this. And so when we were in grad school, when we were calculating interplanetary missions, you say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have a boost phase, a coast phase, and a deceleration phase of this mission. And that plays into orbital mechanics like crazy. Like I'm going this fast, and so I'm going to behave this way in this celestial system, but I'm going to be changing my velocity over this really long length of time. Therefore, I have to lob the softball in front of the, you know, in front of the runner this much, but it's changing. But yeah. Right, right, right. All those things matter. It's fun, isn't it? Isn't that neat? Isn't that a neat problem? Yes. About? Yeah. It is fun. It's yeah. super fun. And I'm feeling that thing where my brain opens to new possibilities and new under just new questions I I couldn't have asked an hour ago. 
or questions I wouldn't have even thought to have asked an hour ago. They're working. So a rocket versus a freight train, a rocket that doesn't liquefy the passengers versus a freight train. There are very different reasons for that incredibly slow acceleration. Yeah. But that freight train maybe takes an hour to get to speed because of the limitations of the propulsion. It's not propulsion, but the limitations of that steam engine, let's say. It's so much weight that there's no way to exert that force immediately. If you did, you would break you would send a, a a whip like shockwave all the way down that train and everything breaks. Everything breaks. Yeah. If like in the expanse when that that hyperdrive, I don't remember what they called it, it was named after the guy who discovered it in the expanse. When he discovered that on accident and engaged it, and he couldn't turn it off. The acceleration was so immediate. There's this amazing scene where he knows what he just accidentally did. He just like he discovered the thing that's going to unlock the solar system to human travel, but he can't turn it off because he physically can't reach it because it all happened at once. And I don't remember what happens to him in that scenario, but in that moment I was like there's something like I get this on a basic level as to why that would be hard, but to the person who's really into physics and calculus and these kind of calculations, I bet that scene was much more profound. As you watch the the dilemma expressed in a very human emotional way. Don't, don't tell me more about that because I want to. I should watch that. Okay. Yeah. So the train has to accelerate slowly because of the limitations of the fact that it's on rails and all this friction acting upon it and weight and all of these different factors, and you can't accelerate it at that rate. The old train that is, the rocket. We've got to think about that curve and calculate what's going to work on that curve, not just against. Uh, the limitations of space, but against the limitations of whatever you don't want to come apart, the construction of the vessel, the construction of the human body that's residing inside of this hypothetical vessel. And so what looks to somebody like me, like a bunch of stupid curves and circles and signs that we don't really understand, is the complexity of that equation of how do we make this thing go from point A to point B in such a manner that is uneven over the course of its voyage so as to accommodate for other variables that are not on that chart, like the ability of the human body to sustain certain forces. So the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, and the integral is the area under the curve. And you can do all kinds of other things. Like You can revolve integrals around an axis. And so you can take that from an area and you can turn it into a volume. There's other types of math where you can either you can do what's called surface integrals. Like you can do these really strange equations and you can do all kinds of things. You can sweep you can sweep an area along a function. You can do all these different things. Go ahead, your face. What? Sweep an area along a function. You made a gesture with your hand that the third chair couldn't see. What do you mean by that? Like imagine imagine you have a circle and you, you put that circle way out there, and then you you have another circle, and you pull that circle around, you revolve it like a merry-go-round around another circle. Like imagine you're at the end of a merry-go-round and you have a hula hoop sticking out, and somebody pushes you around in a circle on the merry-go-round, that area that, that's inside the hula hoop, as you rotate it, that's going to become a volume, and you're going to make a donut, a torus. And so, so you, you could measure a hypothetical bubble coming out of said hula hoop. Yeah. The volume of the space that's it a covered. Cool, great way of saying it. Oh, how yeah. about that? Yeah. So you could, yeah, exactly. You could measure the the amount of air it, that's inside that bubble. Here's what's cool about this. There's always a moment like this when you explain things to me. What's cool about this, because I don't have the tools to answer the question, I don't even think to ask the question. Right. You just gave me the most rudimentary expression of the tools to ask the question. And all of the bewilderment you're probably seeing on my face is not bewilderment. It's a whole new aspect of encountering the world just starting to creak open to me and a little bit of light is shining through. An hour ago, I would not have thought about that hula hoop creating a volume behind it as it moves being held out from a carousel. I just wouldn't have thought of that space as being a space. But what you already explained to me was enough to be like, oh, well, like the bubble trailing behind. I don't mistake that for some sort of clever revelation. Everybody who does this thinks in those categories already, but I don't. 
I'm sitting here musing on why I don't. Why would I not think to ask that question? And eventually I probably would have thought to ask that question or to see that pattern. But I often muse at us looking at a thing together and there's stuff that you think about or that you wonder about that I just don't see. And then there's other stuff that you wonder about, like tension on cables on a multifaceted power line bracket. And I'm like, yeah, I see that question. I would ask that. But all the things, it, it occurs to me that you see and I see at the same time, and you bring up an observation, and I say, oh yeah, yep, I get it. I wonder about that too. It corresponds with how much math I've done. And where my math runs out is where my questions run out, and where your questions extend into places that make me shake my head and go, just how would you even think to ask it? Well, calculus is beautiful, and you can use it to uncover the magic in the world. Like, for example, how water flows in a pipe. Like, it's way more complicated than it sounds. And you can use calculus to figure out, like, oh, well, the, the water in the middle of the pipe is going to move faster than the water on the edge. Because the water in the edge is touching the edge and it's not moving, but the water in the middle is moving as fast as it's going to. Same thing in a river. You can figure out if you can do enough calculus, you can figure out how the vortex sheds off the edge of a butterfly wing. But you can figure out how much. Okay, get this though. The pipe thing you just told me, no idea. You saw the blank look of, oh, oh yeah. So pipes are constantly, oh, weird. The butterfly thing, I don't know. But when you talked about a river, it's like, oh yeah, I know. I know what all that water is doing, top to bottom. I know if I put a beadhead nymph six inches below the surface that's dragging through water that moves at a certain speed, I know exactly how far down in the water that's going to go because I know what feeding zone the trout's going to be in. And I know how many inches below surface on a drag at a certain speed of water I need to be to get into the feeding zone of a trout that size that's feeding in that pattern. So it's there. But again, the only reason I've asked those questions is because I'm trying to accomplish a task and I'm trying to consider these multifaceted things, including the curvature of my line that is sitting in the water that is dragging my fly behind it. And if I get it in water moving this fast, I get a curve. I get a a physical curve of my green fly line that I know is bad. If I see that curve and there's this much blank space under it, if, if the integral sucks, I'm not catching a fish on that cast. I need that curve to be shortened, or that means that the speed at the end where the fly is is going to be moving at an unnatural rate that will not work for a fish and I will not get a hit. So I'm going to ask these questions where I have a physical need to or context for it, but I would, I've got a tiny little bit of category just from this conversation for what I've taken years to try to intuit about how water in a river is moving at different speeds, depending on depth and obstructions and all of this different stuff. And you just see the world that way. I think it's cool. Your body's really, really good at calculus. We're super good at calculus. You can catch when, when you're catching an object, you're setting two equations equal to each other so that the velocities of your hand and, and the object match at a certain point. So you're setting up a boundary condition and you're, you're just solving the equations. It's super cool. It's cool. It's cool. Now, let me take you one step further. There's this other element of math. It's, it's basically fancy calculus. It's called differential equations. I've heard of this. And so differential equations lets you do more interesting things. Like, okay, we're on this rocket, and we're going in this direction, and our propellant burn rate is this. So our mass is getting lighter as we go. So that means we're, we're actually pushing with the same amount of force, but our acceleration goes up because our mass is going down. And so imagine like a, everything is, it's like an unbalanced seesaw. And then you have to, and so there were, there were ways and control systems, which uses a lot of diff EQ, where you can like dial back on this one and you can tune things. If you were a master at tuning things with math, you could do what's called control systems using differential equations. And so I'm not great at that. I understand how it works. I understand PID control loops. I understand all that stuff. What does PID stand for? Uh, Proportional integral derivative control loops. Um, But but, I'm closer to understanding what that meant than I was an hour ago. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Yeah. And you know what I want to do? 
I want to call Grant Sanderson because you asked me things that were really interesting. You said, what is calculus simply explained? I would like to hear what he said. All right. Uh, Grant Sanderson for the third chair is a pal to both you and I, and he's got a kicking awesome YouTube channel. It's just a phenomenal math explainer YouTube channel and a podcast that he does on the side with that. And well, we've talked to them before on and off mics. And so, yeah, just so people know, that's who we're bringing on. Someone who I view, even though I don't understand what hypercompetency looks like in this field, I view him as being kind of a mega guru. He's one of the best math teachers I've ever encountered, ever. This episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by Raycon. Raycon makes earbuds that I love. I've got, let me see now, hang on, one, two, three different iterations slash generations of Raycons. And I always have a set of at least one of those different iterations within arm's reach. And a big part of the reason that this works as an everyday carry is that you get eight hours of charge out of the earbuds themselves and 32 hours out of the case. It just goes and goes and goes. Yeah, everyday carry. Here's the question. Do you put the little lanyard on the Raycon pill box that, you know, they, they come with a little bitty lanyard and there's a little hole on the side. Do you actually install the lanyard or do you, do you like not to? I put it on one and I was like, yeah, I just, I don't need it. It's just not how I carry around earbuds. So I did not put it on the next two iterations, but it's nice that it's an option. I actually enjoy it. I thought you might be a non-lanyard type person. I am a lanyard wait, person. Why? Why? No, wait, back it up. Yeah. Why am, why would you assume that? You seem like the kind of guy that's like, no, no, that's, no. It just seems like you're more of a free pill kind of guy. <laughs> what the heck does that phrase even mean? I don't know. What I are call, you doing? I, I know. I just call it the pill, the charging pill. And I, oh, okay. I thought about it. I was like, I am a lanyard guy because I like to like spin the lanyard on my finger because I like the weight. Oh, like the lifeguard when you were 13 at the pool. Yeah, exactly. I love doing that, mm-hmm. and and you just seem like the kind of person that wouldn't do that. I'm thinking about like angular momentum, and then I I can use my other finger to like shorten sh- like shorten the the length of the lanyard. So like you're spinning on one finger, right? And then you put your mm-hmm. other finger up there, and then when the lanyard comes on, it wraps around the other finger. <laughs> do you know the shape of the curve that that it, makes? You no, know, it is. It's just like the the whistle with the lifeguard. I, that yeah, I understand exactly what you're talking about. No, I don't think you do. Do you know the shape of the curve that the lanyard makes when you constrain it like that? The shape of the what are you talking about? No, I don't know the shape of the curve. If what you, you were to plot the the Raycons as you spin them around your finger, and when you put your second finger mm-hmm. there and you constrain it so that it has to wrap around your fingers, there's a yes. name for the curve that the Raycon charging box would draw, and it is an involute curve. That's the name of, of that curve. A name for it. Yeah. No, I did, I did not know that, but I like learning. Yeah, and, and that's the curve that is the optimum curve for, for gear teeth. Anyway, we can talk about that later. Wait but, a second. An involute curve. So what makes it an involute curve? Is it the fact that it's a decreasing orbit with each rotation? Exactly. That's it. Really? Yes. And so, I don't know. There's a whole thing about that. I'm going to go into that later in this other thing, but... I just want you to know that. And I I knew without you telling me that you would be a non-lanyard person. So whether you're a lanyard person or a non-lanyard person, third chair, please consider supporting No Dumb Questions by going to buyraycon.com slash NDQ, and that gets you 15% off your order. And uh, that's it. It's that simple. Yeah, there's a reason that these, specifically the everydays, have like 48,000 five-star reviews floating around out there. It's just good gear. Buyraycon.com slash NDQ for 15% off your order. No matter what line of uh, earbud you want to use, Raycon's got you covered. They're great. Seamless pairing. They're a wonderful product. I love them. Buyraycon.com slash NDQ. Okay. Okay, we got Grant Sanderson on the line. Grant, you hear us all right? Oh, yeah, I hear you perfectly. Glad to be here. We've been talking about calculus. I know embarrassingly little about this. And what we're discovering is that it's something we already knew. Destin's a very good teacher. I'm a guy who really enjoyed trig in high school. I really liked my Mm. physics classes. I really enjoyed geometry in like seventh, eighth grade, whenever that was. But 
my college and graduate and postgraduate studies didn't have me around mathematics a lot other than some really abstract philosophy that is kind of mathematical in nature. So I think I, I think calculus came up at some point. I think I had a class or something like it, but I don't know what I'm doing at all. And so I asked Destin to bring this down to the most basic level. And one of the questions I asked him that I think we wanted to get your take on was if geometry studies shapes, if trigonometry specifically focuses on triangles, what does calculus do in the most basic mm. of forms? I mean, it's, it sounds like you're most of the way there, honestly, if you love trig and you love geometry. Um, I, I would say in the most basic form, the things that are easiest to deal with are linear processes. So, you know, some car is moving at 10 meters per second. What that means is that after one second, it moves 10 meters. And after two seconds, it moves twice that. After three seconds, it moves three times that. Things just add up nicely. And when you draw all of this out as graphs and shapes, um, you just get straight lines and all of our intuitions kind of line up well. But a lot of the world is uh, nonlinear. So, you know, if I say you have an investment and your money grows 50% every year, you know, after the first year, it goes from $100 to 150. After the second year, it goes from 150 to what would be 225. So it's not yeah. just stacking up like $50 each year. The, the amount it's growing depends on the amount that's already there. And if you were yes. to graph it, graph your money over time, it doesn't look like a line anymore. It looks like a curve. And so in the broadest yes. possible sense, what calculus is doing is it says, hey, we understand the linear stuff. We can deal with that. Great. How can we use our understanding of the linear processes to um, and map that onto the nonlinear ones? And the whole flavor of the study is to say, you know, you zoom in a lot. Like if sure, let's say your investment is growing in this nonlinear way. On, on the grand scope, it looks like this curve. But if you zoom in a lot, it just looks like a straight line. And if I said, you know, your, your money grows 1% after one year, how much does it grow after two years? It's not exactly right, but it's basically right to say it grows 2% after those two years. Like it's approximately linear when you sort of zoom in and you have small numbers. And so the, the whole art of calculus is just kind of taking that stuff that we do understand and then trying to say, how do we, um, how do we piece it all together in the more complicated situations where... Uh, where it's the, it's the whole wide suite of all the interesting things in the world that aren't just straight lines. It's whatever curve you want to draw. And, you know, that might sound vague and it, it's easiest to understand when you have a very specific problem you're working on and you want to know the specific answer to it. But you asked for a, <laughs> you asked a broad question and that's, that's probably the, the broad answer. That's wonderful. I'm grinning with the grin that I have when something totally makes sense. And hmm. my guess is that there, we call it, the people who listen and participate in these conversations, we call them the third chair. There's a ton of people in the third chair who are here because they super like Destin and they do what Destin does. And so mm -hmm. I'm sure that they've been, because I, I know the people who listen, I know what they're like. I'm sure they've been gracious and patient with my ignorance in asking these questions. But also I'm sure that to some extent they're like, oh, wow, this is really elementary stuff for what we do. But there's a whole huge percentage of people who listen to a program like this and they don't understand calculus or use it. They're like me. They work on other things, but they're competent enough to have a thing explained to them in basic terms and take something that has for their whole lives, I bet, just been a metaphor for real complicated math that's too smart for normies like us. And now all of a sudden there's a box for it. It does what you just said and what you just said made sense to me. So on behalf of I mean, all of us, thank you. it has this reputation, doesn't it, calculus? It, like yes, it the, the word itself strikes fear in, in a lot of people. And it's sort of, it, it, it's meant to encompass the idea of like math beyond a certain point. And I, I think there's kind of an emotional reaction to it that um, like if you just unpack it and you look at some specific case, like everyone thinks about curves or they, or they think about when like, they, they might not use the word nonlinear, but they, they think about when things don't just add up the way that you might expect. Uh, like all, all, all the subject is in math is just trying to grapple with that. It's a funny thing where like, it's both uh, way easier than it sounds, right? Like it sounds like this intimidating thing, calculus, and you get into it, you're like, okay, okay, in principle, this is fine. But it's also way harder than people give appreciation for it. Like there's so many different depths at which you can understand it. You know, you take two years course in it in college or something, and you can solve problems and do a bit of engineering. But then when someone really starts asking these annoying questions of how exactly things are defined and get into the philosophy of infinitesimals and things like that, like it actually is a really hard subject or there's a lot of nuance. And in some ways, the, the um, reaction that people have 
at the outset of this intimidating sounding thing is sort of justified when you get into it. Like there's a reason that historically people grappled with it for quite a, quite a while. And like even the version that Newton and Leibniz, you know, kind of invented was not really rigorous. It wasn't solid math for around like a hundred years, even after they kind of initially forayed into it. So when people do have that reaction or that um, sense that it's a complicated thing, it's, I don't know, it's worth recognizing that that's like even the smartest minds have agreed. To oversimplify things, it feels to me like when I did geometry and trigonometry, and those are skills I've continued to use my whole life, it feels like there's an end game to those. Like, all right, mm. now I understand all the basic things that you can do in linear geometry. I get it, or circular geometry. I understand the, all the things you can do with trigonometry up to a, a pretty reasonable point. I mean, of course, I'm sure there's more. I'm, I'm not the knower of all the things. But it feels like calculus is just this catch-all with no end. To me, it feels like this, this frontier of knowledge that can encompass anything that I would ask beyond the boundaries I would now think of. Is that a reasonable understanding that, that there's something a bit more finite to how far that you can go with more linear processes? Yeah, I think that's a great description. It does have a certain boundlessness. I mean, I mean, I would say there's, you know, there are things at the frontier that aren't calculus, right? There, there's plenty of things we don't know that have nothing to do with the, the infinitude of calculus as it spins out. But what you're describing is head on because by its very con construction, you know, it's saying let's answer all the things that are harder than the linear processes. But it's also confined in its own way because the calculus itself has these limitations where um, it describes processes that are maybe not linear, but smooth. Like when you, when you draw the graph, it's a smooth curve. You could actually do it with your pencil. But there is, you know, it's worth highlighting or at least pointing out while you're talking about frontiers. Um, there are a lot of very hard questions in math that become hard because they're not smooth and because calculus, as powerful as it is and all the tools that it provides, don't address it at all. So like fractals um, would, would be an example here or processes that have a certain kind of chaos and infinite roughness to them when you try to you know, draw out what they're doing. Even something which is infinite and has this boundlessness feel is still not all encompassing. I don't know if that's more or less comforting, but it's uh, it, it, it's worth pointing it's, out. It's more comforting. Kind of fence around it. It's more comforting because you get to a certain place in abstract thought and philosophy where you're like, all right, look, these are the possibilities for this philosophical question. Questions about knowledge, questions about determination, certain ethical questions. It feels like you can kind of get to the end of it and then to get any further, you've got to go into the open-ended stuff where you're almost into to running alternate simulations to the metaphysical reality that, that we think we experience in order to go back and revisit those simpler subjects you'd cover as a freshman or a sophomore undergraduate student in philosophy. So when you say a fractal, are you talking about like the unpredictability of, of how things break, to use a simple term? Or is it... Well, yeah, here... I'll give you a concrete example because it's it's easy to get vague if you just try to say this abstractly. Let, let's say you're modeling population growth. And so you've got some population out there of, you know, rabbits. And the simplest model would be that the, the rate at which it grows is proportional to the population itself. You know, the more rabbits there are, the more are there to have babies. And so um, you would expect that the bigger the population, the higher the rate of growth as well. And that would give you this exponential curve. Uh, but, you know, more realistically, you've got resource constraints. You can't have trillions and trillions of rabbits. They eventually run out of food. So if you add another term in there that says, um, okay, that, that rate of growth is not just proportional to the size, but uh, it's also proportional to um, some, some kind of rate limiting capacity minus the current population. So the closer the population gets to this capacity, you know, how much food is there out there or something like that, yeah. then it'll slow down. And now here's the funny thing. If you study this in calculus and you're doing differential equations, it's, you know, it's a hard problem, but it's very solvable. And uh, if you were to graph it as a curve, instead of an exponential curve, you get a logistic curve, which looks like the letter S. It starts to curve upward like an exponential, and then it hits this um, inflection point where it starts to then curve downward and kind of up, tapers off and approaches that carrying capacity. All this is wonderful. It's solvable. It's intuitive. You know, it lines up with our sense of how a lot of things grow and then sort of taper off. Where it gets interesting is if you ask the question, not in terms of calculus with smoothness and continuous time and things like that,
but you say, what if rabbits are a seasonal animal and all of this reproduction doesn't happen in a continuous way, but it happens every year. So there's kind of this discrete moment when all the babies are had and that happens every year. What, what would happen if you have the same governing law that says, in general, they grow in proportional to the population, but you've got this carrying capacity. Right. And then the answer, even though in calculus land, it's simple and solvable and uh, students uh, can handle it. The answer becomes so wildly, wildly, wildly interesting. It's, it's hard to even describe. Um, but <laughs> basically, like de depending on the factor involved, either it will uh, they stabilize to just approach some constant population or if you tweak that carrying capacity a little bit and you tweak the, um, the rate of growth and you get the numbers just right, you can get it to oscillate between two populations. You would expect that every other year the rabbits are big, then the rabbit population is small and it always oscillates. If you tweak it a little further, that period doubles and you can get it to oscillate between four population sizes. And if you keep doing this, you get this period doubling and eventually you get literal chaos. Like the pattern, the, it's not randomness, but the, the predicted pattern from the equations of what the rabbit population will be is that there's no repetition. It just every year it's a different population size with no apparent pattern. And people have tried to like graph and geometrically kind of describe um, this relationship between the parameters you can tweak and the, the populations it cycles between. And it's a shame this is a podcast because there's such a beautiful image that comes about. But you get this, um, this fractal, this infinitely intricate shape that no matter how far you zoom in, it, it has more intricacy. It has all the self-similarity. And, and it's oh. such a weird thing where this simple question that the, you know, students in a second year calculus course could be answering when you ask about things that are smooth. If you slightly change your assumption to make it a little bit more real world, it goes from a student exercise to being kind of infinitely intricate. And um, that you, you see this a lot where the scope of what calculus can do is great and it's wide, but it's still fenced in. It, it, it has limitation and it's not really the be all and end all of solving engineering tasks or of addressing the questions about the world because sometimes things aren't smooth. And in the same way that, you know, uh, trigonometry or and not trigonometry, but let, let's say that in the same way that the simple stuff is limited by being linear and calculus breaks out of that. Um, we, we, it, it has its own, you know, uh, constraints, which leaves open a whole wider frontier of how you handle not just the nonlinear questions, but the non-smooth ones. You genuinely love math, don't you? Oh God! I mean, you, you said I need to keep it short, but I, I will. I, honestly, you've got to shut me up at some point because I, I honestly would happily talk for hours and hours here if you uh, I, if you didn't rein it in. I I'm going to do that now. I'm going to shut you up, Grant. But you uh you do have a uh, a podcast about this, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, re recently started. It's just called the Three B One B Podcast, and um, yeah, just chat with mathematicians of all flavors. That's awesome. And, and I, I assume you talk about little things like what is calculus, right? Just the simple stuff? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, why are you laughing? <laughs> no, you, you joke, but I think I think like the episode with Stephen Strogatz might have included just that. Um, hmm. That's fun. Hey, Grant, thank you so much, man. We really appreciate it. Anytime. Yeah. Uh, glad, Dude, I, glad you're engaging with this stuff. Yeah, I, I feel like I have learned a ton in the whatever 70 minutes we've been sitting here talking between you and Destin. Thank you both of you guys for being able to think outside of the volumes of knowledge and understanding that you've gained to be able to remember what it was like to not know that and therefore to be able to come back to people who don't and make it make sense. That's that's awesome. I'm distracted right now because Grant was telling me about this chaos stuff and I'm sitting here trying to figure out why cicadas come out every 13 years. And you did that to me, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the rabbit hole. It's a deep one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Grant. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Grant's awesome. Grant's awesome. Yeah. And you guys both are. No. I asked this a very complicated question. Take the version of math that everybody thinks of as being the hardest thing and make it make sense to somebody who doesn't know anything about this stuff. That's uh, impressive, man. There are next levels. The the uh, The hardest math I ever did was called continuum mechanics. And you learn about these things called tensors. And uh, I don't even want to talk about them because I hate them. <laughs> okay. But a tensor, I'm doing it now anyway. A tensor is a matrix of matrices. And it's crazy. 
you use this thing called the Einsteinian notation. And I remember getting out of that class and like thinking to myself, okay, that's the best I'll ever be at math. <laughs> that's yeah. my limit. And it's it was limited. And the reason I hit that limit is because a lot of the reason was because it goes beyond three-dimensional space so far that you can't visualize it. You have to like, there's this next level to your brain. I don't know. It's it's crazy. So I felt that when I got to subjunctive mood in Spanish. That was that was I just that was the moment where it's like, man, I either got to keep powering or I'm done because that hurts. I just I just don't conjugate verbs in Spanish. <laughs> you know what? It'll get it done. <laughs> It'll like, get it done. <laughs> hey, man, this was great. Thank you for. Uh, I know a lot of times, like I'm thinking back to the the Dead Sea Scrolls episode where I was so out of my depth and I I just got to sit back and ask questions and uh, I really enjoy these kind of things. Um, I, it, it feels weird being in the, I'm doing air quotes here, the teacher seat. So um, I appreciate the way you were making me, you were challenging me to, you know, when you go back to the fundamentals and you, that's when you really learn. Like the ability to understand something enough where you can share that information with someone else. That's really, really cool. And I really appreciate you taking me there. My disciplines are much more accessible at the basic level. Story, narrative, philosophy, history. Everybody thinks about that stuff. The stuff that I've asked you to to try to walk me into, like the, you know, the 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 propulsion episode, this conversation, like I don't even know the terms. Normal people don't even. We never think in these categories. We have no idea how to get there. The task of you asking me to explain the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is something you'd already heard of and had a conception of, is a much simpler task that sets me up to make for a much easier back and forth without anybody really being in the seat of teacher. There's just no other way to slice it. If I come to you, I'm like, dude, explain calculus. I'm putting you in the seat of the knower because I can't even fake being the knower. I can't participate in the conversation. All I can do is sit and learn. And I think I think you do a great job in navigating that. Even just sitting here in the room with you socially, you do a good job of not making me feel like a big dumb idiot for not knowing. So oh, whatever. Dude. I like the way you handle it. This is one takeaway I would love I would love to give you that there's no math words associated with it at all, but it goes back to that little mental moment I had in the car as a kid, Mm -hmm. get something and hang it from the rear view mirror in your, in your truck and drive just like you normally drive. And it just, what, why are you, why are you looking like that? You don't like to hang things from the rear. I'm listening. I'm listening. A suggestion. Okay. Just as an experiment. (laughs) Hang something from the rearview mirror of your truck, drive, and see if you can drive smoothly without making it oscillate. Because if you do that, you're a good driver. And so, oh my goodness, look what just happened! You know what I'm saying? Okay. And what do you know about me and dashes? You don't like things on your dash. Don't put anything on the da- nothing. I don't want anything on the dash. You have a notebook in the dash compartment on yeah. your truck, and it makes I you mad. Want to just? It doesn't make. I just want to do something with it. I want to grab it and make it and make it go away with my hand because it bothers me that it's there because when you turn or accelerate or brake, it moves. And for me, having anything on the dash, I intuit what it's going to do when I move the vehicle. And I'm afraid one of two things are going to happen. One, I'm going to start playing a game with it. Just yeah. one of those little stupid games we play, like don't step on that crack. I'm going to make it to that tree before the car gets to me. Yeah, Like whatever nonsensical thing we do in our brain, I'm going to do something that affects the larger world around me with a great big vehicle, and that thing's going to move. So it is little micro calculus that is seeping into my world subconsciously when I don't like things on the dash. The other thing I'm afraid that I'm going to do is because I don't want the thing to slide or move, it will affect my driving decision making as I try to keep the thing from sliding across the dash instead of trying to make the world work better. Ah. So, what so you're I'm focused is, inward instead of, I uh, see. And what I'm saying is I've taken your advice. Like when things are on the dash... I do note that and I do internalize it. And it's something that I've thought about that for you and me has just been an ongoing thing to rib me about for my psychosis. But maybe there's actually some of your world and what bothers me about having things on the dash. My daughter's learning how to drive and that's the way I explained it to her. I was like, you need to not be accelerating at all times like your mother. 
<laughs> you know, like I'm gonna I'm gonna accelerate to the next stop light so I can break really hard. I would like to initiate a new policy where we each get one can't edit that out token yeah. that we can use. No, I wanna other... edit that out. <laughs> I got a token. I wanna... no! It's in my hand. Oh. And I'm using the token. I love you very much, darling, and <laughs> oh. <laughs>